Peggy 18. really just excited about doing another culture, another city. And so that's why we wanted to move down to Karnaka. My wish was to go at the edge of this world in a city where the sun is uh, impacting a lot the mood. And uh, it was allowing us to, to create some uh, weird atmosphere and to twist uh, things. And I proposed Karnaka because uh, to me it was really, really different. It's closer to the equator. There's more vegetation. It's more of a blended culture. The atmosphere is way more dense. It's based on a photo trip I did in Long Beach, Los Angeles. Well, at sunset, the sun makes the atmosphere coming really thick. The sun is super weird. As we talk about the dances, the foods, the songs, the, the different weather, how wealthy people would go take in the sun on the beach to sort of cure their maladies. One of the things we also talked about was the demographic of where the various people came from. It's really important to build the history of a city. So we started two centuries before the action takes place. In my imagination, there were natives on this island. And then I imagined a wave of settlers from Morley, which is an island that we never visited in this honor. These are these tall, blonde guys. They are bulky. They started a small village with the natives. We decided to bring some people from Bristol, from Dunwall. They split the island in two, making a huge canal. It was making a direct link to Dunwall. That means people from different countries working together, fighting together. It was a nice setup for the story of the game. So we were done with the shape, the land mass around the city. It was time to bring this industrial flavor that everyone was in love with in this number one. I was pushing to have something uh, really unique. So that's why we have this giant peak. What if we have wind that goes through this giant peak and have shaped a wind corridor? My first idea was to set up silver quarries there. And what if we put a district there where people suffer? Imagine how they think and how they survive in this district that brought a lot of different structures like the windbreaker, the way the blocks in the district are shaped in diamond shape to funnel the wind, to break the wind. The giant mills, it ends up with something really, really cool story-wise and visually. We've focused a lot more on verticality. When you travel to Karnaka in Dishonored 2, you'll see the contrast on the rooftops. There are far fewer of A-frame roofs, and instead you have a flatter rooftop. It obviously has uh, gameplay ramifications. It adds so much freedom to the original experience. Now you can access the roof with blink, the balconies, or you can take the stairs, or you can uh, climb on the light poles. The fact that you have more space to play in, I think it's a good thing. One thing that I like to think about Dishonored 2, and Dishonored in general, is that some people have labeled it as a stealth game, an action game, but I think it's even more than that. It has some element of an exploration game. It's not only about the fighting, it's not only about the sneaking, it's also about like discovering the space, slowly getting your bearings, orienting yourself in the city, uh, understanding how it works, how uh, the people there uh, live, how they react, different factions. The fact that there are neutral factions also allows the player to explore without fearing to be attacked, uh, which is a good thing because the artist has done such great objects, totally typical to design. At Arkane, we focus a lot on the really small details in the world. You can sneak, enter apartment, and uh, review what's there. For example, the typewriter that everyone is uh, loving. People really love when it's functional. And now, if you press spacebar, you hear the sound, you see it moving. We design each object so they can be built in real life. I really think that returning fans and new players will be blown away by the richness of this uh, new city and this world 15 years later.